I'll be talking today about uh, functional on Android. Now, probably uh, a lot of people have just seen the talk uh, about Hugo, Hugo uh, on Rx Android uh, or Rx Java, and uh, this is the majority uh, of my talk as well. But actually, before I get to many many code examples and things, how I think that Rx uh, works so nicely on Android. Uh, I'll very quickly cover functional, like the why functional on Android. Well, like what's the difference between functional, reactive, Rx? What does it actually mean, lambdas? Like how does it actually come together? And um, Rx, I started using it. Um, I think for like most people who start using it by seeing that Retrofit supports it, and you you suddenly get some, like out of the blue, there's this super elegant way of of of, of making network calls on the back round thread and getting on back on your main thread and like wow there's no more async tasks no callbacks no boilerplate and and I got interested and as part of my open source work I started getting interested and in playing around with it if you know me it's probably because of these open source uh, work either through the Rx cupboard library which I'll cover a bit later or via one of my uh, apps I made the RateBear app for example if you ask me anything about Rx, please do so afterwards. If you want to ask me anything about beer or brewing, you can ask me as well. Um, this app is an open source app. I wouldn't necessarily say that it has the best architecture, but it, for me, it, it served as a real playground for Rx. And I got so much interested in it. And then I thought like, wait, but wait a minute, what's, what is Rx? Like, it's like it's bringing functional concepts. So I knew a bit from my background, um, in science about functional programming and Haskell, but it, it's not really Java. Java is an object-oriented programming language. So <coughs> really what we have is lambdas. We have uh, uh, Java 8, which is bringing some like um, the ideas of, uh, of, of streaming uh, to uh, Java and uh, making transformations. And so this is reactive, right? Well, it's true that lambdas is coming from a functional programming languages. and. We all know in our classes, you know, for example, when we write uh, comparators uh, to sort a collection, we have written a code like this uh, all the time. And I think if you haven't seen Labdas before yet, probably you have by now, that there's lots of boilerplate actually involved. And you will see throughout my talk that I hate boilerplate. <laughs> boilerplate is for me uh, uh, always a good excuse to, uh, to move to something else. and. And Labdas are a really great thing. Like Android Studio will even tell you, hey, wait a minute, why are you writing it like this? It will give you like a little gray line underneath. And if you look at Android Studio, even if you're not using Labdas, it will already try to collapse this code into something that's much more concise and only shows really the code that actually is d does something that is functional. Because really we can do away with it. The collection sort, uh, the compiler knows that, you know, you're going to put a comparator in here of string, so so you, we can we, we can re remove this, and we also know the method signature, so we can certainly remove that and the parameters. So what we are left with is really like the the, 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 the core of the the core of the code, and this is um, definitely I would say you could use Rx without lambdas and lambda notation, but I would say don't use retro lambda or Jack compiler. So really what we do is we have a lambda and of course the notation in Android or in uh, Java is uh, like this. No, not very well spaced out. This is the same one written in one line of code. We have now our comparator. It's still an inner class and in effect if you see if you would use not, not Java 8 uh, natively but um, Android uh, backport of lambdas or retro lambda, it will still like under the hood compile this into a, an anonymous inner class that's what it is but it the code is now concise and we can you can even make it a little bit uh, more concise arguably but if you have a method that does this then all you need to do is not only like refer to this method 
but you could even write it as a functional reference, and then it's written like this in Java. Now this this is concise code, I think. And we'll use this notation throughout. Uh, so the other thing that that is in Java 8 now is streams. So this, like if you've seen uh, the, the talk from uh, Hugo, or you already know a bit about Arc Java, this 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 code, like where you would loop over, you wouldn't you wouldn't do that. Instead, you would have already this list of numbers. So what you would do is actually you want to apply these two transformations, converting it to an integer, or uh, filtering the even numbers. We would of course apply tr um, uh, a mapping and a filter operator. So what we do is we have a stream, and we map, and we filter, and we do something with the result. But this is not our extra that I've used. This is actually the Dave 8 streaming API. So this looks very similar, right? And even if you don't want to use or cannot use Java 8, you could use something like uh, stream support, which uh, is backporting this, because Java 8 is not like readily available for us on Android. Uh, in fact, Android N did add support for the streaming APIs in Android N, but it means that you have to use the min SDK of Android N, so this will probably in like 12 years or so we can use that. <laughs> um, however, you can use like a, a, a stream support library and you get actually pretty much the same notation, pretty much the same performance as well. Slightly less attractive perhaps because you have to wrap this, this list, but uh, well, that's that's really a minor thing. So, is so, so how does this retain like to, to Rx and to reactive frameworks? Because if we would write this in a reactive way in Rx Java, like this looks pretty much the same, right? Like an observable and you map it and we subscribe to it and that's it. But there's actually a vast difference between them. You could start out with streams in your application if you want to learn more about like how, how this like streams of, of, of data objects are, are going to be mapped and like shown somewhere. But there's no combination, there's no threading. Well, there's a you could actually do this par in parallel, but that's about it. You have no control over the threading at least. So reactive programming is much more than just like the streaming API. It's interesting to, to, to use it to learn maybe, um, but reactive adds so much more. It Yes, sure, it is a source of um, data objects that are being emitted via an observable. But we also get, for example, the incomplete and the on error that we, as we have seen. And these are very powerful concepts and we get threading. So yes, there's collections, but the collection, they just push items through a stream and it's a one-time use and that's it. Reactive interfaces, reactive frameworks are actually uh, there are different frameworks, and Rx is just one example. We have Rx2 as a release candidate 5 just now. So we're sure going to be doing Rx Java 2 uh, a lot now. Uh, Akka Streams ex ex exists, but it actually is, um, Akka Streams is, uh, is written in Scala, so you wouldn't really easily pick that up in Android. Uh, Reactor Core exists. It's also a really good reactive library, but it's min as like you have to use proper Java 8 for it. So it's not really usable on Android. And uh, Java 9 will add its own flavor called the Flow APIs. All Java 8 basically does right now is specify uh, reactive interfaces. So these are functional interfaces that other libraries built upon. And actually with Java, with Arcs Java 2, will be interrupt, um, there will be an interrupt with other reactive libraries. So conclusion is still the same. Yes, use Arcs Java on Android and not streams or one of the other reactive frameworks. But I hope I gave a little bit of the impression like, well, like how did we arrive here? So now we'll get to some more code. Done with all like, well, how are, what, what are we going to use? Well, f part of the beauty of using Rx on Android, I think is in the, the transformations, sure, of your data, the operators that we can apply, but definitely also uh, the threading, the fact that it's a reactive pool, which I'll explain in a second, and uh, the way we can use back pressure. Because actually Rx, we use it all the time because we can do such elegant threading, but by, by, by nature, like unless you do something manually, it's not multi-threaded at all, or it's, it will be synchronous. It's so if here we just uh, map numbers 
which are the IDs of something, and we do some network call block that is blocking, and then we filter it out, and we apply this into some log, it's still all synchronous code. So there's like, the, 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 if you do this on the main UI thread in Android, it will still block. And by the way, let's stop now using random data like numbers and items. Let's make something more interesting, of course. Uh, we map these IDs, and we get some information from our beer database. So we get we we call the network and you definitely use retrofit because it's like has native support for Rx and it really if you use retrofit it looks like this you just do get beer give an ID and you have an observable and then you map it maybe you only want to filter out the beers that are uh, have a rating higher than eighty percent and those we want to show in our interface so what will happen now is that this these these numbers which we uh, had originally in our list. They will get emitted one by one through the chain, and it will get transformed into something we'll show in our interface. So one thing the first to notice is that uh, since it is still synchronous, what we really want to do is start making uh, to indicate to Rx where we want to switch threads. So uh, we, we subscribe in the I/O thread because we want to start emitting items on the I.O. thread. There we do uh, a mapping uh, to, the, to get the bare information from the network. We filter it, we're still on the I.O. thread. And then we observe this back to the main thread. That's the moment you switch to the, the next thread. And uh, we can very beautifully on Android um, do this multi-threading. We're no longer blocking the user, this is great. And not only that, we're actually doing a reactive pool. What that mean, reactive pool means is that uh, if you say apply an operator, take one, we only need one item that we want to show in our interface, it's show beer. The first beer in this list of five IDs that actually has a rating higher than 80%, then the first item will be emitted, number five, you'll get the data from the network, you compare this, say for example the first item is lower than 80% rating. So it's not emit. So it's not em it's not uh, filtered, or through, through the filter it's stopped. It's not e further emitted. The second item goes through. Reactive framework RxJava will request a new item from the original source, which is your observable numbers, number three. Now say that this number we we make the network request and say this number now does uh, represent a beer that has a rating higher than eighty percent. Now this item will get emitted further. The operator take one says, okay, you only needed one item. Now we can stop. So none of the other uh, IDs will be used to make a new, start a new network thread, etc. So actually it also makes very, it's concise code, but also very efficient code because just by taking this operator, and of course now it's all on one line, but you can imagine that you have like, uh, like a singleton somewhere that that provides the observable to get uh, data from the network. Like maybe you put this in the network class, you could get beer. But then somewhere else in your application where you actually want to use it, you you can apply on this on this observable the take one operator. And still you have this efficiency. So there's so many, that, 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 and this is all plain Java. So actually on Rx, uh, on Android, there's lots of cool stuff that we can do. Much more examples to come. Definitely use Rx Android. You see already that I post to the main thread. Well, the main thread is a concept that's coming from Android and not from Java. So you need Rx Android. Rx Binding is another really cool library that allows you to bind uh, Rx streams to views, Android views. So you can both use it as a source of to, to, to create a new source of emissions and you can also use it to apply. Now to apply like in the subscriber uh, to some uh, view you would use a little bit less and when I saw that Hugo uh, recommended not to use Rx for UI I agree on uh, the subscription but actually on the source, I actually still quite like it because now we can make one chain where we transform this user input to uh, some action on the screen. And in the meanwhile, maybe we can do 
uh, here a scanning operator, which basically is just adding one plus one plus one plus. Every time you click on the user, click uh, the user clicks on this button, VDRX view clicks, basically creates a click listener for you and starts emitting events. One emission every time you the user clicks. So you map this, and basically now we're just counting the number of clicks. We map it to a string and we show it. Um, now this, of course, isn't very interesting. You could just apply a click listener. But what now if you would do it on a different thread? It's like we want to uh, subscribe on computation thread. Uh, Rx view clicks will emit on the computation thread. Uh, we do this complex operation of counting one extra. And then, of course, we apply. Uh, oh, then we get an exception. <laughs> why do we get an exception? Well, why do we get this exception? It's an easy one, right? Yeah, exactly. We are still on the uh, computation thread, and we cannot modify our fields on the computation thread. So we add the observe on on the main thread. Uh, so now we added the main thread. We are and does it work? No. Illegal state exception. Why? Exactly. Yeah, we cannot modify fields. Uh, on the thread other than the main thread, but we can also not uh, apply the clicks. So when uh, my recommendation generally is that I would always write, <laughs> it's a bit counter to what you guys say, I would always write the subscribe on as the very first one. Well, actually, so first of all, I would apply them where you also subscribe. So if you have somewhere a source where you would just create an, an observable, I wouldn't necessarily apply the operators there, maybe. Uh, to uh, switch threads, but definitely the moment that you subscribe, and I would always put the subscribe on as the first item actually, because it makes sense. It's uh, it's the source subscribes, so it starts emitting there, and that's the thread. So here we use the main thread uh, to uh, start our emissions, and then of course, uh, if you apply an observe on, that's the moment you switch to another thread. So that's in line in your chain. And earlier somebody asked questions like, do you have any recommendations for style? I actually like the style where every operator is on a new line, so the identification I think is important. And then if you maybe do a flat map where there's some more complexity going on, you can add another identification. Other stuff we can do with is Rx binding now, since we have our widgets uh, and UI events generating um, uh, generating emissions uh, tr as an observable. Uh, so we now have a stream of um, view events. Then we can maybe combine them. We have two checkboxes here and a uh, text uh, view or maybe an edit text. So that every time the user taps one of the checkboxes to turn it on or off, a, an emission is made. And also the edit text, every time the user types something in this edit text box, uh, an emission is made. And then we can use Rx to filter, to map it, to what apply whatever operators we want. In this case, I say like, okay, if the text changes that this user has typed, first of all, map it to something that checks whether the, uh, the, the, the length of this comment is actually sufficient, so 80 characters. And then in the end, combine these three sources to say very concisely, okay, only enable this submit button if you have agreed on the terms and conditions, and if you either checked the checkbox for no, I have no comment, or actually made a comment that's 80 characters long. Um, another example. What now if we have an edit text, which is used as search input? Do we want every time the user enters some text or removes some text, do we want to launch a new query? Well, no. Typically, we don't care about every individual character. We want to wait a little bit before this user has eventually stopped typing, and now we want to, you know, do the actual query. We can apply the debounce operator. Debounce basically says, okay, wait. Every time that, that we get an emission, so in this case, uh, changes in the text. Every time, wait up to one second before we actually emit this, and only the last one will be admitted. So. If I type uh, three characters, only the last, like, and we and within one second, then only the last full 
emission, which is all three characters, will be uh, pushed down the, the stream. So, sure, that's easy enough, but then we actually directly flat map it. So, these three characters that the user now typed in, for which we waited one second, we directly start a network request. Uh, of course, we have to do some uh, threading because we are subscribing this on the main thread and we are observing this on the main thread back again. And now what we have in one line of code is a mechanism where we can uh, delay the actual network queries and show them, do the network query on the background thread and then uh, show them back on the interface again. And um, so when we say don't touch the UI with Rx, I disagree on that part. I think this is a really great example of how you can use Rx even as a source uh, for your observables, transform it and show it again. Some words of warning. Uh, first of all, you can see that dbounce takes an, uh, a scheduler, so you explicitly have to say. Other, if you don't, then it will um, pick one for you, which is, um, I believe, the computation thread. And uh, you probably wa don't want to use that, especially since you want to subscribe on the main thread. Another thing is that since we this is a hot called a hot, hot observable, is because the user mm, can still tap every time that he wants, enter more text, it never finishes. So there's no uncomplete uh, necessarily in this stream. Your uncomplete will never be called. Um, so depending on what operators at the end you uh, want to apply, this might this might be a problem. For example, if you apply the to list operator, which gathers just all the data, all the emissions, puts them in a list for you and it admits all the emissions as a list, this relies on the fact that your stream actually completes. And since this stream never completes, because the user can keep on putting new information here in there, uh, this wouldn't work. So you, you cannot use to list here. Um, Right, another thing that you can use RxJava for is something like an event bus. We all know event buses, they're very simple, really, to use. Well, they're definitely simple in Rx. You apply what's called a subject. A subject is uh, both an observable but as well as a subscriber. That sounds complex, but how it works is exactly like an event bus. You can, to this uh, subject, you can uh, submit items to it with on next. You just call on next on it. And this will then we uh, to all and every subscriber that uh, that we have on this subject will get this emission. So, for example, in a background uh, service, we are doing some synchronization on Android, and we have this uh, subject. So we push to this subject. We are now synchronized at 15%. Now, everywhere in your interface that is that currently at that time subscribed will get to this event and perhaps uh, update the progress part to 15% or um, something else we can do is uh, you know, map it and to make sure that the sync process is actually finished at 100% and only show the interface if this happens. Behavior subject is a specific subject. It remembers the last value you've sent to it. So every time that a user subscribes to it, uh, it will also emit the last item that you actually uh, have sent to it, which is very useful in this case, because the moment that you subscribe in your activity to this uh, behavior subject to say, hey, give me the sync progress, you want to have the last current well-known status. Uh, there are other types of subjects. Um, There's a uh, replay subject that actually remembers all everything that you emitted to it. Sometimes it's useful. And there's also a published subject that's more like your traditional event bus. It remembers none. So every time you send something to it, it's forgotten. And all, of course, all your current subscribers, all, uh, all, all your current subscribers get this event. But if something else in the future uh, you subscribe to it, there's, n there's no information yet. And you can see that it's already sort of like a, a caching going on. And Android and caching, I think, uh, can be solved quite elegantly uh, in Rx. Uh, why do I say there's already some caching going on? Well, this last synchronization uh, value is temporarily stored there. You probably you do need to like have it somewhere accessible, and that last value is cached and, and readily available. And if you would use a replay subject, you would even have like all the values cached. In memory, of course. 
sometimes in memory you don't want to use a subject because it's not something that is living throughout your application all the time then we can also apply the cache operator uh, if we have a, uh, a source uh, a network call again we can apply the cache operator what this does is basically um, it uh, caches every value that it receives and then all the subscribers will get this same value so here if we have two subscriptions normally without the cache this would make two network calls but since we apply cache operator we only have one network call and the same value will be sent to both subscriptions cache is actually implemented in, in rx as the replay operator plus an auto connect auto connect we've seen yet uh, in uh, hugo's talk So you can rewrite it as replay auto connect. Why would you do that? Well, replay actually accepts arguments that can say, well, how long do we want to cache this? So cache caches is for in indefinitely. But here maybe we want to say like, okay, it was like a, a 10 minute cache. That that sounds good. And after 10 minutes, it will it will sort of like lose this value. So if you would have a new subscription to the same uh, observable. It will say like, well, I no longer have a value. I have to make a new network request. Now, uh, I, I'm sure you can think of many ways how this could be uh, used on Android. But one way we can use it is in the lifecycle. Because on Android, we have this beautiful system where if, you're, if you rotate your device, the whole activity is stopped and destroyed and recreated. It's a, a brilliant choice. And uh, we have to deal with that every day. Uh, well, how could we use this caching? That's, that's, that's quite interesting, right? I mean, even if uh, you don't really want to cache anything beyond the scope of using the user having to use this, this activity, it would still be nice to have this value readily available in the memory if we just rotate, do as simple as rotating a device. Well, we definitely can. You just keep uh, this uh, cached, um, you just keep this cached observable, or if you prefer to use a subject, you keep this uh, subject somewhere that is uh, you know, persistent in memory. So you could use a singleton, maybe you would have like a repository pattern where you have like um, a, a, a network and uh, object, and every time you ask get bear, you would actually also uh, cache this value. Uh, maybe you would, prefer to put it in a retained fragment. Fragments are your thing. Uh, you could put it in a non-configuration instance as well. What you put in is actually this, the observable itself that is cached. How does it work? Well, uh, we have a, a non-create of our activity. Normally you would just do like the observable, you know, threading, subscription, very easy, done. Now we rotate the device and we have to redo the network call. How do we solve this? Well, using the cache operator is one suggestion. So instead, we have the network observable cached. We store this value in a local, uh, you know, in a, in a, in t temporarily in a, in a field. And then during the on, non uh, on retain non-configuration instance, we put it in there. And of course, now I only had one subject, so I just could put it in there directly, but you could use a simple wrapper uh, class that contains multiple objects. And Android will contain this during the um, reconfiguration of your activity. And um, you can uh, get it out again in, uh, in your uncreate. The next time when your uncreate is called, this um, you get get last non-configuration instance will actually be non-null. So this is the cached observable. We apply it and magic, the value that you already had cached in there will be reused. So what happens if the network call wasn't complete yet or maybe not even yet started? Well, actually, then it will uh, start a network, network call as you would expect. So this is still all memory caching, but sometimes we actually don't. We want to have a little bit of a longer uh, persistence well, what about data database caching? Well, actually, I write a little bit of a wrapper around Hugo's uh, cupboard library. Cupboard, I don't know if you know it, but it's a very, very sm simple uh, way of wrapping cursors. And most people use it 
to wrap database cursors. It actually will also happily for you generate like the whole uh, database, all the tables, uh, do upgrades. And why I like Cupboard, I wouldn't recommend it in huge products, but actually in lots of cases, you just have like one or two tables and you just want to use like plain old objects, Bojo's. We don't want to hand, we don't want to write our own as create table statements. We want minimal boilerplate. And actually with Cupboard you can, uh, it does rely heavily on defaults. So for example, you have to have a primary key that is uh, underscore ID, which is a long, but that's not a problem, right? Like our, our tables have like a primary key. And this is like, this is all the code that you have to write to create a connection with your database to generate the tables, etc. Well, technically you have to overwrite new SQL light helper yourself and call through two methods, but really like it's like four lines of code to create this whole an, an object. And the RX cupboard wrapper that I wrote basically just wraps around cupboard and makes everything observable. So you could do something like RxDB, say query all the elements from the beer class. So beer class now automatically is a beer table in your database and I get all the items as an observable uh, of beer. So the moment I subscribe to it, I will just get all the items. And this supports reactive pool, so if eventually I apply an operator and we filter and we only take one, it will not like convert all the objects in your database table into POJOs. No, it will only do this for, um, for, th for the beer that you actually need. You can, you can do... Um, selections of course work uh, where statements and you can get a specific concrete item using get uh, we can also store data uh, using put rx dot put uh, it just accepts an item from your stream and happily puts it in a database and you could use it either as a as an observable uh, in, in your subscription to use it as an action or maybe you use that action as a side effect. Or you can put it somewhere in your stream uh, and everything that goes through your stream will automatically be stored in the database. So how do we um, use that? Uh, say we have our network call again, everything that's just mapped through, like everything that's going through the stream, I just map it by put it in the database and I can still do the rest with it. Afterwards, I can just apply the operators as usual to list I do here, uh, any other operator you want to do. But now we have all the data in the database. Uh, and since we are putting and deleting always true, of course, the delete is supported as well. Putting and deleting always true RX cupboard, it actually can emit these changes itself as a new observable source. So there's an observ uh, if you call changes, it will provide you any database change that will happen, or perhaps the change is only on one specific class. So what we can do then is, for example, we, um, we want to request the actual item that is changed by calling entity, or if in case we are only interested in a database insert, we do something like this. We say like, oh, off type is just like the RX, uh, RX operate, uh, operator off type filters only the uh, database insertions. And so what this stream produces is only the bare objects that are, in, that are added to the database. So if some background process is for you synchronizing and adding objects there all the time without any connection at all, I can have in my activity a uh, observable stream that uh, gets all these new additions directly readily available for you to show. Unfortunately, due to type erasure, uh, we need to cast here. It's a little bit ugly. Maybe I will have to introduce, instead of changes, also uh, something like insertions that always only uh, generates database insertions. Then we don't have to cast. It's a bit ugly. So how can we use this then to cache instead of a memory cache? Well, we had this uh, rxdb.get to have a database uh, source, an observable that emits all the items readily available for the database. In this case, we're only interested in one item. And we also, as a backup, provide a way to, um, to ask for the same item via the network. And if we do get it via the network, they redirectly put this back in the database. How do we combine them? We take the 
concat operator for ARCs. We supply it with DB and fresh observables. Uh, we subscribe to it and we're done. So in the case that the object was already readily available in the database, it will actually be emitted. And otherwise, you know, we'll have to get to the network. But wait a minute, there's one thing missing here. This is, this is a hard question. I, I do have one cup here. But, but what's the problem with this one? No one? It would actually pull out too. It will still do the network request because no, no, nothing is stopping the, the second observable for like actually starting and making this network request. And we didn't want it. So we have to say first. So what will happen is that this concatenation operator, it will only like it will it will it will like first start subscribing to the DB observable source. It it emits this item. The first operator says, "Hey, first you only have you only interested in one. Stop now." And there it it will never ever even have to start the network request. Uh, a little bit differently, if you would want to use both sources, both because you have an offline data already available, but you also want to show any information that's live. Then uh, you could do uh, something like this. You you query all the items for, uh, by uh, brewery uh, Pioteca here from Lutz. Uh, you're interested in all his beers, but maybe he re they release some. They very frequently they release some new beers. You know they're very experimental craft brewer. So we also want to do this uh, live network requests. We merge the both together, and then we get both uh, from the database and from the live source. And now one more chance to win a cup. What is the problem with this approach? Nobody? A hint is that um, both the DB and the fresh will immediately start emitting items. Yeah, that well, I I I consider that the correct answer. So the, um, it will actually emit both. So if the item, the same item, is in the database and the network, it will emit both, and you will get both. And you probably don't want that. You you want to do something like distinct. But you are right. In this case, it can still be that you know uh, the item is actually different. So the way that Rx compares, like if an item is distinct, yes or no, is actually by using uh, equals. Uh, some warnings, well, I think I can skip this. Uh, beware, it's very much aware of leaking subscriptions. Not every time you can leak. It's, it's, you have to do something to leak. For example, to have a hot observable, like uh, generating click events. Uh, maybe longer running operations, they can definitely leak. But it is sort of safe to assume, like almost all cases, you can leak data if you do not unsubscribe. So, you know, if you... <laughs> If you're worried and you don't want to deal so much with it, always unsubscribe. Make sure it's done synchronously. So if you subscribe and start, unsubscribe and stop. And do the same with resume and pause. I have um, you actually have the Rx life cycle library, which can help a lot with this. Uh, basically, you don't have to manually unsubscribe, but it will be unsubscribed the moment that the view disappears. But this will only obviously work if your activity lifecycle is known. So there's you have to extend uh, your activity from a, a base activity. But it's still good, uh, look at ARC's uh, lifecycle. Another thing is never, ever, ever create your own observables using, on crea using create. Always use like from or just, um, or because like, for example, if you think like, oh, I'm going to generate like, I have this click listener and I'm going to put this like make sure that this is a source uh, that I can use, an, uh, an observable. Uh, never do this in the top because basically you have to manually deal with back pressure, the, uh, unsubscribing, just use from emitter and it's very eloquently. Actually here you can even specify uh, manually a back pressure mode if you should, if there's a problem with back pressure, should you drop the items, should you cache them or something else. Uh, be very aware of blocking code, be because the top one here, if I'm just going to create a source with just, I might think like, oh, this is brilliant, uh, uh, but this actually will not wait with the execution of the blocked call until you subscribe. This will directly execute the blocked call. Why? Well, why wouldn't it? I mean, you're calling this code right here. 
it's not an inside and inner class. So what you want to do is you want to defer this. Historically, we used to do this with the defer operator, but, um, but then you had to use defer and just. Actually, now there is a from callable operator, which basically means that it will wait until you subscribe to this observable by actually uh, performing this network request. I actually do have a little bit of time to talk about ArcsJava too. I already hinted that there is a release candidate 5 right now. It will have some changes. As a user, uh, probably at first you won't find that it's like everything in the world changed. However, there are a couple of big differences that you should be aware of if you are interested in starting using ArcsJava 2. Maybe if you have not done ArcsJava at all, you could start with ArcsJava 2. There's really no reels and it's not more complex or anything, except be aware that we no longer have just an observable. We also have a flowable and they're basically the same thing, except the, uh, the uh, a observable does not support back pressure anymore. And the flowable does. Now, back pressure is a complex topic I did not discuss, but if you are a little bit aware of it, Basically, if something at the source starts sending events up your stream and somewhere up your stream, you cannot handle it all the time, uh, you have a problem with back pressure. And then either you have to drop the, the source emissions or you have to cache them somehow. For example, if the user starts clicking like frantically uh, on some button or you have some other source that is like going too quick for you, uh, maybe you're just randomly emitting numbers unless you implement back pressure in some way. And Arch Java 1 implements back pressure in practically every operator itself for you. Arch Java 2 does the same, but only in flowable and not unobservable. And if you, you can you can switch from the one to the other, but you have to expli be explicit about what back pressure uh, style you want to use. And uh, uh, this, the same goes for subjects. Subjects still exist, but you have processors and subjects are the back pressure aware version of a processor also if you do dot subscribe historically of course as we've seen it returns a subscription it no longer does this actually if you do need the subscription because you want to unsubscribe and you do use uh, subscribe with instead of subscribe and actually you start you do use create to create observables so i just say never ever ever use create that's true but that's on ArcJava 1. On ArcJava 2, create is actually what is, what I just said, is uh, what from, a, from callable um, is in ArcJava 1. So actually they just changed the names to make it a little bit confusing, but um, that's fine. If you're interested, I can say something about Agera. Who's interested? Nobody, good, good for you. <laughs> uh, I totally agree, don't use it, don't ever use it. However, then I can make some recommendations. Uh, most of them I already covered. Definitely use Retrofit because it's, it's just like, a, it's beautiful. Not only the API itself, but definitely in combination with RxJava. Um, Android Reactive Location is actually really nice. It's a way to uh, have location changes from the user. So GPS from the via the play services uh, as a source. And you, you can really eloquently stream this like every time the, the you know, the, the location of the user changes and you filter it out that the change has to be you know, over a certain distance and you do a network request and you like, beautiful. And uh, ArxTuples, but it's is a, is a recommendation, but it's more if you're coding this and you're combining observables, you'll run into certain types where you want to use it. And uh, ArxCabbard, I can recommend it because I wrote it myself. However, I have to say ArxCabbard is, based since the cupboard is such a simple tool, if you do more, want to do more serious uh, databasing, perhaps you want to do something like um, Green DIO or Realm. They're both cool and they are adding Rx now as well. The very last thing I will mention, I said Labdas, definitely use them. You would think like, wait, when Labdas are not supported. It's true, Labdas were not supported. Java 8 supports them and you can use either Retro Labda. Uh, sometimes the people are scared for them and anyway, you don't necessarily have to use them anymore. We now have a Jack compiler. Uh, Android uh, N introduced this, but it's backported as well. To um, So if you use a Jack compiler, you can use Labdas in a backported since Android 2.3. I have my rate for application that I showed you earlier, which uses Labdas all over the place. I, apply, I removed Retro Labda. 
I switched to Jack and then I got zero errors and everything was happy again. Thank you very much.